Hello everybody, welcome to Dry Dock episode 94 and it's time to take questions from the videos on American and Japanese damage control in World War II as well as Guide 164, the Kronprinz Erzazog Rudolf and that's the last time I'm trying to say that this video. Joe Brown asks, is there an optimal velocity for naval shells of a particular weight? Sort of, but in World War One, World War Two era naval gunfire calculations, it's almost the inverse. What's the best weight for a particular velocity? And that in turn is influenced by what exactly you're trying to achieve with the shell. Now, obviously, the destruction of your enemies is your overall aim, but how you achieve that makes quite a bit of difference. For example, in very broad generalization, there's basically four primary attack patterns for a heavy caliber naval shell like that fired from a battleship. So you can go with the extremely high angle, try and drop down on the enemy's decks approach, which would be best exemplified by something like the US Super Heavy series of shells in the Second World War. You can go with the more general approach, which is kind of trying to balance shell weight and shell velocity, which is the default for most guns. You can go with the extremely high velocity flat trajectory or near enough flat trajectory compared to other forms of shell fire, um, which is what you see on things like the Bismarck and Littorio 15 inch guns, for example. Um, and was the German approach in the latter part of the First World War as well, as well as Nelson's 16-inch guns. And this aims more towards better penetration of the belt armour as opposed to the deck. And then you have the fourth oddball variant, which is what kind of speed and trajectory do you need to ensure the best performance when diving underwater, which would be seen in a lot of the Japanese World War II era shells. And given that your gun can take a certain amount of charge and can therefore put a certain amount of energy down the barrel, what particular type of approach you want to take to firing shells at your enemy is going to dictate the weight of the shell that you use. So if you're using a given weapon, let's, let's take a hypothetical 15-inch 50 caliber weapon, you can roughly work out what you probably want your shell weight to be for the standard approach by just looking at what everybody else is using at the time. So you're probably looking at something in the region of 1,900 to 2,000 pounds, something in that, that kind of weight bracket, maybe slightly more, slightly less by 50 pounds or so, depending on your exact national flavor, but there you go. If you want to then take the American-style very long-range very high ballistic arc drop down on the deck approach you would take a heavier shell it's going to fly, uh, fly slower but it's going to ha come in at a much steeper angle much faster now with this approach because you are firing a heavier shell using a similar charge and you're coming in at a steeper angle much quicker you're sacrificing a certain amount of belt penetration in exchange for earlier and better deck penetration the inverse of this is you can go for a slightly lighter shell using the same charge and this will increase the velocity of the, the shell which means it's going to fly on a much flatter trajectory over the most likely battle range scenarios which means it's going to be striking the belt at an angle that's much closer to vertical which means it's going to have superior penetration in that respect and also it's coming in with a high velocity and thus as kinetic energy equals half mv squared the v squared part being obviously very important it's going to hit really hard this obviously sacrifices deck penetration because the angle that it's going to come down on on the deck is going to be very shallow which means it's very likely to skip except at absolutely absurd ranges and you also sacrifice overall range in certain respects in terms of effective uh, velocity because with a super heavy shell you have a lot of momentum so you can keep going at relatively decent speed for a fairly long time with lighter shells than average it's found that those shells will lose speed much faster and because they have less mass once they start dropping speed their overall kinetic energy drops quite considerably so their their effective use as penetrators drops off quite considerably at the longer ranges. 
with the diving shell scenario, you generally want something that's uh, towards the upper end of of the standard paradigm not quite as far as the super heavies because you don't you don't want something to come in too steeply because then if it dives it's going to just dive away and under the ship that you're targeting um, but you do want it to come in at a relatively decent angle so that one it's not going to just skip off the water and two when it dives it can dive deep enough to get past any uh, underwater sections of the target ship's belt armor so that's all using the same gun with the same charges and explaining the optimizations of the different shells but of course if you have a particular optimization of a particular shell you might want to also construct your gun and set up your charges in such a way as to further support that this is why uh, as i've said before the us 16 inch 50 still has hilarious belt penetration even though it's a super heavy shell design because the gun is just so hilariously overpowered in the first place being a 50 caliber 16 inch weapon it just doesn't have quite as much as it could using a more standard setup. Sebastian Chan asks, how were open barbettes ever considered a viable mounting? They leave the crew responsible for the main armament and in fact the weapons as well completely exposed to all enemy fire. So it's a very good question. The answer lies in the race between guns and armor at the time. Guns at this point were gaining something of an ascendancy as armor technology, whilst it was advancing, wasn't advancing anywhere near as quickly as gun size and advances and other gun technology like shells, which were allowing greater and greater levels of penetration. Using the turrets that were available at the time, which is sort of the uh, biscuit barrel or biscuit box kind of cylindrical turrets, to protect the guns, you needed effectively to have the same armor on the turret as you did on the belt, because they're both just slab-sided vertical bits of steel, or in the compound armor, or whatever it was you happened to be using. And this meant that as guns' penetration went up, and they hadn't invented things like Harvey or Krupp steel at this point that would be able to dramatically thin down the material needed these turrets were becoming really really thick sort of 16 17 18 inches plus and whilst you could to a certain extent continue to do that on the ship's belt armor doing it on the turrets made things quite problematic because the turrets obviously much higher up in the ship so it affects the ship's stability a lot more and if you don't want your ship to immediately flip over, that means you have to lower the position of the turrets, which makes them harder to use because the sea can come up and over them much more easily and lowers the overall freeboard of your ship, which makes your ship less able to cope with sea conditions, both generally and in battle. Trying to have an armoured turret that had slightly less armour wasn't really practical because at that point, the incoming enemy shell fire would just blow through it anyway and you'd still have most of the problems with regards to freeboards and sea keeping and speed of rotation of the guns as well except now you also just didn't have the protection of the steel you just had a useless dead weight around you and of course as the size of guns was increasing the size of the turret was also increasing thus even further increasing the overall weight the idea of the barbette was to allow you to carry the biggest, nastiest, longest range and heaviest guns possible, but by ditching all of the armour of the turret it meant you could carry them on a ship that had a fairly high freeboard and you could manoeuvre your guns a lot more easily, and thus you had a better, more stable, more seaworthy vessel. Now, the interesting thing is if you look at the Royal Sovereign class, which is where this particular picture comes from, they actually built one of the class with the traditional turret arrangements. That was the uh, HMS Hood, predecessor to the battle cruiser of the same name. And you can have a look at the two pictures of those two, both the Hood and Royal Sovereign, and you'll see a noticeable difference. Hood is about eight foot less freeboard. And with the advances in guns that were coming along, its turret didn't provide all that much protection for very long anyway. Now, of course, the vulnerability of the open barbette mount to incoming fire was appreciated fairly quickly and also much more rapidly was appreciated the vulnerability to shrapnel and other collateral damage like blast. So you very rapidly began seeing basic light gun shields that were splinter proof being put onto barbettes and then 
the roof was put on to protect from splinters and such coming down from above and pretty soon you had what looked like a modern uh, turret for a brew dreadnought or dreadnought battleship and then once they had that thicknesses started to go up as armor technology advanced so that you could get reasonable protection with thinner plates and thus not needing the absurd top weight. Carl von Garzenberg asks, did any other ship have this kind of triangle mounting of the main armament? This is obviously from uh, the Rudolf video where you have two front mounted guns side by side and theoretically able to fire backwards with a single rear gun. Yes, there were a few like this. Mostly it was concentrated around small capital ships, especially coastal defence ships, but also a certain number of cruisers. And this arose effectively because a lot of these ships that were at the smaller end of their class type were in a position where they had been decided to mount a smaller than average gun so in this case um, in the picture above you can see the German Siegfried class coastal defense ships with 9.4 inch guns which for a battleship is a bit of a small caliber weapon so you couldn't really justify just having one for one aft the firepower would be too little um, at that point you'd have armored cruisers that would outgun you and there was also quite the obsession with end on fire in the latter part of the 19th century, remember, because everybody still thought ramming was a particularly viable tactic. So in a lot of these cases where you couldn't quite justify something bigger like an 11 or 12 inch gun, and bearing in mind that we talk about the latter part of the 19th century, so twin mountings are around, but they're also relatively expensive and complicated compared to singles this is where you might put two single mounts side by side on the front of the ship and then you just have a rear one for whatever purpose um and so yeah so small small capital ships you'd see this on quite a bit but also on a number of smaller cruisers where again the, the maybe the cruiser hull size was just a bit bigger than the average armament that you might give a cruiser uh, or, the, or that you'd chosen to give that particular class of cruiser and so if you just had a single one of that gun maybe a 4.1 4.5 4.7 something like that it would look a little bit silly and the ship would be a little bit anemic and since you had the space and you had the width you might as well stick two on the front and you see quite a lot of protected cruisers like this and one or two armored cruisers as well when they kind of forgot the larger guns the the alternate approach of the time was obviously to put a single larger gun fore and aft. So you see this, uh, if you look at say the Royal Navy's town class, they have, uh, the latter ones have a single six inch forward instead of a couple of smaller four point something inch. And you see that a lot of the German World War I protected cruisers as well, they have two forward mounted guns as their, their foremost armament side by side in single mounts. So yeah, it's a combination of we want end on fire. Our main caliber is just a little bit smaller than is necessarily ideal for our overall size of ship, but we don't want to have multiple different calibers of primary gun. And we really, really, really like the end on fire aspect and twin turrets are expensive. CTXSLPR asks what is the most modern equivalent of a rasé frigate type of conversion on a modern warship so bearing in mind that a rasé frigate takes a 74 gun ship of the line or maybe a 64 and cuts it down to a single deck so there's a substantial reduction in the ship's structure in exchange for repurposing it as a heavy version of something else i don't quite think the cruiser to missile cruiser conversions that you, uh, the questioner mentions in his, the rest of his question actually count in as much as whilst a few elements of the ship were cut down it was more an exchange of one sort of firepower for another they didn't become substantially lesser in the pecking order of the fleet as a result in fact if anything they might have even gone up slightly <laughs> 
So one, relatively speaking, easy example from the interwar and World War II periods would probably be the various aircraft carrier conversions, whether that be Eagle, as seen here, Lexington, Saratoga, Akagi, Carga, Furious, Glorious, Courageous, etc., 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 as well as uh, various conversions such as the Independence class in the Second World War, because until, well, until pretty much the middle of the Second World War, the battleship or battlecruiser is still sort of the, the top capital unit. The carriers are a close second, but they're not considered the, the centerpieces of the fleet, and as I say, until World War II is in the middle of progress. So, yeah, at that point, you could very well argue that taking a battleship or battlecruiser and then cutting it down by removing all the complex superstructure, all the guns, etc., and then just sticking a flight deck on top of it and making it a carrier, that's technically an example of a Raze conversion, albeit that, um, for various obvious reasons with the flight deck, t- the technical volume of the ship actually increases, weirdly enough, but there you go. You could also argue that the conversion of various destroyers into APDs, the fast troop transports, counts as a Raze conversion. In as much as, again, you're cutting off sections of the ship's overall as-built structure and weaponry to accommodate a use that is further down the pecking order in terms of combat value compared to its original form. With more modern warships, it's somewhat harder because the weapon systems, etc. are so integral to the overall ship that they're either useful or they're not, at which point they tend to get scrapped. So there aren't so many examples of what you might call post-1950s Raze type conversions. There's certainly what you might describe as Raze style changes of use, but without the associated cut down of the physical structure of the ship. The Essex class carriers would be a good example of that, because obviously in the middle of World War II, they are the fleet carrier of the US Navy. They're big, they're mean, and there's lots of them. But as time goes on and carrier design gets larger and larger and they get somewhat left behind when it comes to operating the heavier aircraft through just physical uh, constraints, you see some of them repurposed as landing ships, some as uh, helicopter support ships for anti-sub warfare and the like. So in usage terms, the Essex class are being razzed, but ironically enough at the same time most of them are actually having their structural size increased with the various refits so that would be a kind of a technical one i guess scott havens asks what was possibly the best ship that was never completed i started but left unfinished i think there are two ways of looking at this there's the okay let's line up all the unfinished ships assuming they were finished and get them to fight each other which one is going to most likely come out on top at which point the answer is relatively easy in that it's the montanas simply because well what's it going to compete with it's going to compete with maybe the h39s the lions with the unfinished yamato class and the sovetsky soyuz and it's fairly argue, uh, easy to argue that it's uh, superior to any of those. There is, however, another way of looking at things, which is which unfinished ship represented the greatest advance over its contemporaries. And in that category, I think I'd have to pick the G3s, notionally battle cruisers. Now, I say that because when you look at the Montana, the Montana is a clear Lin- not quite linear, but relatively clear outgrowth of existing US battleship design. The Iowa's the bit of the oddball there. Um, so if you look at North Carolina, South Dakota, Montana, taking into account the sort of the additions from the Iowa to so like the 16 inch 50 caliber, it makes sense. But it's it's an evolutionary form, and at the displacement that it was being put at, its features are not exactly surprising for the time. Whereas when you look at the G3s, uh, along with all the other Washington ships, the Washington era treaty treaty era ships that were removed from play, it's quite considerably more advanced than any of the others. It's got 
heavy battleship grade armament well it's battle cruiser so of the period so you'd expect that but it also combines that with high speed and okay fair enough lexington and margie do that as well but it also adds in armor that is comparable with the south dakota 1920 and uh tosa class designs so you have effectively if you don't want to call hood the original fast battleship you have this as the next candidate uh, down the line as a proper fast battleship and you can sort of extrapolating that the way i look at it is what would happen if you took those ships into the next conflict i.e., in that particular case world war ii the n3s for all the fact that they're basically floating steel blocks with massive guns on them are slow the same applies to the South Dakota 1920s. The Tosas are a little bit quicker, but um, their armor isn't anything to write home about Matt particularly. Um, they're kind of in the same vein as the Nagatos at that point. And then you look at the Lexingtons as well. Obviously, Lexingtons were historically converted in carriers, but their armor was awful for a capital ship of that period. And if they hadn't had massive refits, they really would have been they would have been in a similar position to the congos just bigger um, and the margis are slightly better off in that respect but not too much especially considering that we're talking about all the washington ships being carried forward whereas the g3s have the advantage of battle cruiser like speed but battleship like armor and heavy guns and uh, unlike nelson and rodney because these would have been built at proper spec they would have actually worked so in terms of a paradigm shift in how capital ships would have been considered I'd say the G3s, but if you're going to go and just do top trumps, then obviously the Montanas. Scott Havens asks, I've wondered if the swordfish attacking Bismarck were aware of the weak point on Bismarck. Were they briefed on it? It's hard to imagine just having a very lucky shot. Is there any info that the British knew Bismarck specs or about the weaknesses? I've certainly not seen any particular evidence that the swordfish were briefed on a particular weak point of the Bismarck's design. One of the things you've got to remember is that by the time Bismarck was in any way substantially completed or indeed launched, there was a fair bit of tension and hostilities going on already. So um, depending on how exactly you classify hostilities, but anyway, um, yes, yeah, so basically, you know, the British didn't have precise measurements of exactly where Bismarck's weak spots might be. And when you look at the accounts of the swordfish pilots, well, one, you've got the fact that dropping torpedoes from the air at a moving target is very much a you're lucky if you hit anything kind of maneuver in the first place and when you see how many torpedoes that the swordfish did hit Bismarck with most of them were around the center of mass which is roughly where you want to try and hit with an aerial torpedo anyway to maximize your chances was where you try to aim at least the the shot on the stern was I think very much a lucky one it's sounds relatively unbelievable I, I grant you however you've got to take into account that when you look at the history of ships being torpedoed from the air strikes to the stern area are not actually that uncommon they obviously don't make up the majority of hits but Yamato during Operation Tengo was hit several times in the stern obviously Bismarck was Prince of Wales during uh, Force Said uh, last encounter was hit in the stern relatively early on by a torpedo and in fact it's that hit that pretty much did for her um, Vittorio Veneto was hit in the stern by an albacore uh, which in the lead up to the nighttime part of the battle of Cape Matapan and once you expand that out to things like carriers and cruisers or battleships hit by submarine torpedoes there's even more so Generally, I think the reason there's a reasonable number of stern hits is because most of the time, whoever's launching the torpedo is generally trying to aim somewhere in the middle of the target just to ensure they've got the most chances to hit because then if they're slightly over or slightly under on their estimates, they'll still hit something. Whereas if you aim for the bow and you slightly un uh, overestimate the target speed you miss and vice versa if you aim for the stern and you underestimate the target speed you miss... Now, I think it's much more common for people to slightly underestimate a target speed because, generally speaking, when a target is trying to evade a torpedo, they will tend to ramp the engines up to full bore as best they can, 
regardless of anything else. And so you might end up with uh, ships going just that fraction faster than everyone was expecting them to. And so it's probably going to be, you're going to find with aerial torpedoes, it's slightly more common for a hit that doesn't land amidships to hit a stern as opposed to in the bow. Although bow hits with aerial drop torpedoes were still um, things that did occur as well. And the other thing you've got to bear in mind is that it, as much as hitting the stern was a weak spot of Bismarck's general design, hitting the stern at that exact moment was also a very, very uh, good stroke of luck. Because if Bismarck had had its rudder centred at the time, then, yeah, its manoeuvrability would have been impaired, but it would have been able to steer using the en its uh, engines a lot better than it was able to with the rudder jammed. Graham Dean asks, to, to my understanding, damage control in destroyers and cruisers was very important, especially in engine room areas. I think I'm correct in saying HMS Belfast had a pressurised boiler room, so restoring this was important to maintain power and speed. Well, to be honest, damage control in your engine room is probably one of the more vital areas of the ship anyway. But broadly, yes, in destroyers and cruisers, it's even more important. And the reason it's generally important is not just because of, well, it's your engines, you need those to move places, but also because due to the sheer size of the machinery, engine rooms are one of the few spaces on a ship that have to be very big, that you can't cut them down too much in size. I mean, obviously you can subdivide them, have different engine rooms and bulkheads and stuff, but beyond a certain level of restriction, you simply can't do it because the machinery just requires a certain amount of volume. And large spaces deep down in the ship that can be flooded are generally very bad for your buoyancy. So, yeah, both of the factors of, well, keeping yourself moving and powered and also not wanting to sink mean that damage control in an engine room is particularly vital in cruisers and destroyers doubly so because simply because of their smaller size they can't afford as much if any torpedo defense which means that well a you're more likely to have flooding in the area and b also your speed and agility are even more a defense against torpedoes than uh, it is for larger capital units for example so once you've been hit, assuming that that first hit didn't take you down in the first place, if your engine room is in trouble, it's pretty much your first priority for a destroyer or cruiser to get repaired beyond absolutely anything else. Because if you go dead in the water in a ship that size, you're going to get hit another time. And most ships of that size class are not going to survive getting hit another time. In fact, with destroyers, it's probably a miracle they survived the first time. And also, yes, if you are running a positive pressure boiler room, then you would also need to get that back up and running as quickly as possible because, as as you say, that does contribute to your available power and thus to your available speed. Whilst, obviously, even on a carrier or a battleship, repairs to your engine rooms are pretty vital, it doesn't quite have the same level of urgency although it's still a very high level of urgency, mainly because a large battleship or a carrier will have torpedo defense systems. So in the event that you're losing power because one or more engine rooms are flooding, if you take a hit, another hit or two, it's obviously not something you want, but on a ship that size, there is a reasonable chance that if your torpedo defense system has been designed properly, it might be able to soak up another hit or two without being immediately fatal to your ship in the way that a, a hit in a similar space on a much smaller ship might be, especially as a large, large compartment like an engine room. Noob Lord asks, how would carriers with damaged flight decks take on their air crews again at the end of their sorties? If there's a big hole in the middle of the flight deck, I imagine it's quite hard to land a plane there. Well, yeah, if your flight deck looks something like this, you probably aren't landing any aircraft anytime soon. But it does depend greatly on both the extent of the damage and where that damage is. If the damage is somewhere astern, maybe anything up to about halfway up the flight deck, then if it's anything serious, yeah, pretty much forget it. Um, however, if you've taken a hit in the bow, um, or maybe on the, the forward lift or something like that, uh, 
then with most aircraft of the time, you could still recover aircrew um, on the stern part of the ship. The beauty of World War II aircraft carriers is that you don't actually need uh, the full length of the flight deck to recover aircraft, at least in most cases. And uh, you can operate with certain aircraft, um, rec launch and recovery operations at the same time, just kicking aircraft off the front and recovering them at the back, albeit this is somewhat dangerous, which is why you have crash barriers and the like. Um, and obviously it varies if you're sending a fully loaded torpedo bomber off the deck, that's going to require a bit more of a run-up than a lightly loaded fighter, for example, but never mind. So yeah, this, the location is important, and then obviously also the extent. If you're talking a damaged flight deck, like say you're a, a British carrier in the British Pacific fleet, and a kamikaze has charmingly scraped some paint off your flight deck and bounced off into the sea, well... It's technically damaged, but you're probably going to be all right. On the other hand, if you're on fire and listing quite severely, then it probably doesn't matter where that hole is, because uh, no one's going to try and land on a carrier that's like that. But the, the last part is also to do with the precise nature of the damage, because actually you might end up with some, a flight deck that doesn't look that badly damaged, but is still completely useless for landing. So, for example, if a big heavy semi-armor-piercing or armor-piercing bomb just punched through your deck and made a relatively small hole, you, that might be, you might think, oh, I can land an aircraft past that, you just have to be a bit careful. But if that bomb, in exploding further down, sharply buckles the flight deck, then you're in problems. Or worse still, if, say, that bomb's coming in at quite a steep angle, it might go in through your deck, hit and explode somewhere in the vicinity of your lift and poke your lift up a bit um, or down a bit to be honest one way or the other but basically meaning your lift is no longer at true level with your flight deck then visually from a distance you might look absolutely fine and just looking generally you might think, oh, there's a small hole that's fine but if your if your flight deck's up or down by a foot or two eh -eh, sorry if your lift's in that manner and it's a rear or center lift you ain't landing aircraft on there anymore so yeah, it, it depends very much on what's going on. With that said, with even with the, the big holes, well, relatively speaking, even if you've got a reasonably large hole punch through your flight deck, there are damage control measures you can take to at least temporarily patch up enough to get lightly loaded aircraft that are coming back landed. Something this size, probably not so much, but there you go. And uh, if you can't take your aircrew on again, then it depends, do you have help? If there are other carriers in the vicinity, then they can take on your aircraft for you. If you were the only carrier in the area, well, that's a bit of a problem, but that's when you designate one or two of your escorts to pick up pilots and tell everybody to uh, splash land in that area. Robot Bjorn asks, would a World War I era battleship survive the iceberg collision that sunk the Titanic? Generally speaking, they'd have a better chance, mainly on the grounds that most World War One battleships are both going to be travelling slower than the Titanic and also are more agile than the Titanic and therefore far more likely to actually avoid the collision entirely, but assuming that they run full tilt into the iceberg in a similar manner to the Titanic, they've still got a better chance due primarily to the fact that, well, as warships, they are far, far more comp compartmentalised than uh, the Titanic ever was. And so the chances of containing the flooding are relatively good. And obviously they have dedicated damage control crews to uh, try and help with that. And on top of all of that, there is also the possibility, depending on the ship, that it might be fitted with anti-torpedo bulges, at which point, yes, it's almost definitely going to survive that kind of sideswipe because all the collision's going to do is rip a hole along the bulge, which isn't going to actually compromise the hull itself, at which point it's going to be irritating, but the ship's not actually in any particular danger. Ocean Blue asks, How often were ships damaged by friendly anti-aircraft fire from nearby friendly ships also firing at low-flying enemy aircraft? Direct fire incidents did happen, but they were relatively rare, largely on the basis that most aircraft didn't fly quite that low, 
Um, and while people do have eyes, they can generally see when they may be shooting at, <laughs> directly at a friendly ship. The other thing, of course, is the fact that ships are nowhere near as close to each other as they appear in movies and such. I mean, you can see from this kind of picture, how many ships do you spot between USS Enterprise and the ship that took this particular photo? Um, so it would have to be a very, very um, unfortunate precise alignment of anti-aircraft gun and angle to a nearby ship to even stand risk of that and then it would have to be a very specific ballistic arc to actually then score a hit i mean remember there's entire fire control systems dedicated to doing this kind of thing so doing this by complete random chance while happening to be shooting at something that was moving at a completely different rate of knots as well as obviously a different course and like the very likely different altitude is very unlikely but with the sheer number of rounds fired there were the odd times when this kind of thing did happen what was far more risky when it came to friendly anti-aircraft fire was just the general flak barrage if you want to call it that because at the end of the day what goes up must come down and when you put that many shells in the air and that many bits of shrapnel flying through the sky it's going to come down somewhere and that somewhere may well be on the heads of friendly ships now spent shell casings and bits of shrapnel are unlikely to do particular damage to an actual warship outside of maybe uh, possibly cutting some lines wires and aerials etc maybe annoyingly damaging part of a radar array if you're really unlucky but the rest of the ship's pretty much proof against random gravity falling bits of AA ammo what isn't is the crew and there were instances of crewmen being killed or wounded by falling bits of anti of the anti-aircraft barrage which in part I mean it's not a, a it's not the single largest driving factor but in part it's why as you go on, anti-aircraft batteries become better and better protected generally um, in terms of shields and mount turrets and such like. Um, it's not I say it's by far from the only factor, but it is one factor. And, that, and the other thing is also why you see a lot of crew wearing helmets, if they care. I mean, a lot of them would disregard it because it's easier to fight without one, but they're issued helmets in no small part because of incoming gravity born bits and pieces of the AA barrage. And now let's have some Patreon questions. Miko Lightman asks, what is the process of a big fleet passing through a maritime bottleneck like the Suez or Panama Canals or a narrow strait? A lot depends on two factors. One, are you at war or not? And two, which navy are you and where are you crossing? <laughs> it's kind of subsidiaries of each other. So, first of all, are you at war or not, or is there high tensions? If it's relative peace, then, well, you probably transit just like anybody else. Get in line, get a, get a nice queue going, maybe send a support ship or two or an escort first to book your space on the other side, effectively. But it's all much of a muchness. If there's high tensions or a war going on, this is where it gets much more interesting, because you have to consider as I said, who you are and where you're crossing. So if you're in the middle of the, say, Pacific element of the Second World War and you're the US Navy, if you're going through the Panama Canal, you probably don't have all that much to worry about in terms of surface raiders as a big fleet. What you might have to worry about is whether or not Japanese submarines are operating on the other side. But this is why, in the case of the Panama Canal, you'd secure both sides with destroyer patrols and only start exiting your big ships through the canal once you're pretty sure the area on the other side has been sanitized for enemy submarines. That one, to be fair, is a bit of an easy one. The places like the Suez Canal or the Sunda Strait or something like that, they're much more difficult. With the Suez Canal, for much of its existence, it was either notionally or directly controlled by Britain, so... Again, if you're the Royal Navy or British ally, you don't have too much to worry about. But if you are an enemy of Britain, you're obviously not going to send anybody through the Suez Canal. They're not going to let you in rather violently. If 
Britain is neutral in your conflict, then you have to start thinking about, well, can the other guy attack me at the other end? Pretty much similar to how the Americans might worry about Japanese submarines in World War II off the Panama Canal. And you can see this with, say, something like the Second Pacific Squadron. They went all the way around Africa when it would have been much quicker to go through the Suez Canal because going through the Suez Canal would have bottled them all up in place and obviously as they go in would have made elements of the fleet vulnerable at either end to attack and they were obviously terrified of Japanese torpedo boats. Um, so there's that to consider. When you're talking about going through something that's not a particularly tight canal like that where you basically have to make a yes-no decision um, because with the best will in the world it doesn't really matter how big your fleet is it doesn't take that many enemy ships showing up at the other end to just blaze away at the few ships that are at the lead of your formation and then you're pretty much stuck um but with narrow straits like gibraltar and uh etc etc again i if you're at war you have to be on the alert you have to make a balanced judgment because it may be that passing through those straits is the quickest way to get to your destination or you might have an alternate route in which case it might be safer to just take the alternate route if it's just a bit longer but if you feel for whatever reason you have to press on through the straits you have to make an evaluation are there enemy ships nearby on the other side could they possibly be waiting in the straits therefore are you going to have to fight or not if you are going to have to fight or there's a risk of it you have to go in in full battle formation, guns pointing in all directions. Maybe consider when you pass through. So if you think you have night fighting expertise and you reckon your enemy doesn't, try and pass through at night. If you know the enemy's night fighting expertise is better than yours, then definitely don't pass through at night. And uh, so on and so forth. So there isn't one particular process for passing a big fleet through a maritime bottleneck. It's very much dependent on the precise balance of skills, numbers, etc. in your fleet and the enemy's fleet and what particular setting you're going through because as I say peacetime doesn't really make much odds. Times of tension or war you have to make a balanced judgment as to if you're going to go through and if you're going to go through how, when and where and that's going to change on a situation by situation basis. John Hargreaves asks I've been reading a lot about various admirals of the two major wars of the 20th century and come to the conclusion that the most effective and competent of the fighting admirals is a choice between Admiral Cunningham and Admiral Spruance. I have been for many years involved with the Royal Navy technically and in family connections and as a Brit I must pick Ray Spruance as one of as the most effective and technically able of all the fighting admirals of the 20th century. Would you agree? This is actually a really difficult question because the circumstances surrounding both admirals are, relatively speaking, quite different. Um, Spruance has a longer overall period in command, so he has more time to, at least in wartime, to rack up his command skills and achievements since he's in charge of some formation or other pretty much throughout the US's involvement in World War II, so amounting to just under four years overall in uh, command. Cunningham has slightly less time between his command sort of going fully active to when, in his case, he's actually promoted out of active command. So around about three years, give or take a bit, between the initial negotiations with the French fleet in the middle of 1940 and when he gets promoted up into the ranks of the Admiralty. They also have to cope with very different circumstances. Now, Spruance, of course, is coming from a point where... The US Navy is temporarily numerically inferior to the Japanese Navy in theatre, um, obviously with his first big command being at Midway, but for the majority of the time that he's in charge of various formations, the US Navy has a numerical ascendancy, or at least theatre parity, and Obviously, that's going to be reflected somewhat in his tactics, whereas Cunningham, for the majority of his time in active command, is dealing with being in command of the numerically weaker force, 
obviously in the Mediterranean when he's facing off against the Italian fleet. It's only right towards the end when he's working as part of Operation Torch that he actually has a decisive numerical advantage as well as anything else. And these situations inform a command style. You can't really escape from that. Spruance overall strikes me as an incredibly effective combat admiral. And I mean, that's not just going on his achievements, it's the way he achieves them. He has this sort of very cold, calculated aggression that he's able to dole out in very specific amounts. Every time he strikes the enemy, it's calculated. The only time he shows even a hint of really having to to roll the dice and see what happens is at midway, which is the one time he's at a numerical disadvantage and needs to take that chance in order to stand uh, an opportunity of gaining victory. But when you look at a lot of the other battles and scenarios he fought, he is able to establish what is actually my goal, how do I best achieve that goal? And that is a remarkable uh, set of skills for an admiral to have because there are a number of engagements where various people say, oh, well, he should have done this, he should have done that, he could have destroyed the Japanese, more Japanese ships if he'd done X, Y, or Z. But in response to his critics at the time, Spruance's effective response was, yeah, but my job wasn't to kill the Japanese fleet at all costs. My job was to do a specific task, secure an amphibious invasion force from attack, for example. And he bent his energies towards doing that which as I say is, is a key skill for an admiral because not looking at any US admirals in particular but if you go charging off looking for the glory of sinking maximum numbers of enemy ships you do kind of open yourself up for counter-attack and not just yourself but the people you were supposed to be protecting um uh, yeah so um <laughs> The fact that Spruance never has anything like that on his record is, again, a mark of a man who knows exactly what his job is and is absolutely determined in possibly one of the scariest ways, if you're on the other side of uh, of the field to him, of actually doing it. Because you can guarantee that every time he hits you, he's going to be he's going to have calculated in advance exactly how hard he needs to hit you, exactly why, exactly where, and he's going to make sure he hits you as hard as he possibly can without exposing himself which makes him a very very difficult admiral to defeat generally and especially difficult um, once you get past uh, the opening stages of the pacific campaign and the u.s navy has the numbers to back up his calculations cunningham on the other hand his command style strikes me he's not as he's not a risk taker in the pejorative sense of the word but he is in many ways, like Spruance, a very calculated man, but he calculates the risks and the possible downsides. And because he's in this situation where, for a lot of the time, he has numerically inferior forces overall, he has to, to a certain extent, take certain risks that someone in Spruance's position, except for at Midway, probably never would, because... It's the only way to it's the only way to gain victory. But Cunningham calculates exactly how far he can push it and where he where he needs to exploit his particular strengths to the absolute maximum benefit and then pull away. Now, obviously both admirals do have minor mistakes on their record sheets, but neither of them have any major ones. Um and when you look at the kinds of things that Cunningham's able to do. He's able to talk down the French when other admirals weren't able to. He's able to pull off the attack on Toronto. And so this is a this is a classic example of what I'm talking about. The Royal Navy has a problem. The Italian Navy has superior forces. Cunningham could either fall back. He could try and engage them at a numerical disadvantage and try and uh, hope for the best or he could go in with something that is completely new and hit the enemy quite hard in order to disrupt their 
abilities, and that's what he does at Taranto with uh, with the airstrike, ordering that in. And then you look at things like Matapan, where he knows exactly where the Italian strengths lie, and the fact that it's probably not a good idea to get quite so close to it at the Italian mainland during the day. But despite the fact, again, that the Italians have come out with technically superior forces, he's able to exploit the advantages he does have in terms of having a carrier when the Italians don't um, further out to the east of the Mediterranean in order to first drive the Italian fleet back. And then he plays things almost perfectly on that knife edge of chasing them as far as we possibly can whilst not overly exposing the fleet to counter assault the following day. And as a result, he scores a huge victory in the overnight part of the engagement at Matapan. And then you have, of course, the evacuation of Crete, where the army is telling the navy to go away because the army are afraid that the navy is taking losses and Cunningham just sits there and goes, no, <laughs> I'm evacuating you whether you like it or not, almost. And of course, you've got the, uh, the wonderful phrase he uses. See, this is the thing. Once Cunningham's in a position similar to the, what, the one that Spruance is in for much of his command, you, you start to see a really aggressive commander come out. I mean, Cunningham's aggressive enough, as you can see from these examples, but once he has the upper hand, he issues orders like, sink, burn, and destroy, let nothing pass. That, that's that's a heck of an order for an Admiral to issue, especially in World War Two. You could always see him rubbing his hands in glee. It's like, oh, right, now let's see what can happen when I have the upper hand, Mr. Axis Navy, shall we? Uh, so overall, basically... I'm not really able to split hairs and say which one I would least like to face on a battlefield because both of them would be pretty scary prospects. All I'd say is that based on their personalities and based on their war records, which after all was pretty much the sum total of what you can go on, I would say that if you if you absolutely want to split hairs and set, pick a person who's better at leading a fleet for a given task... If you are gambling, well, not gambling, but if you are in command of a large force, but you have a very specific objective you want to achieve and you don't want to get distracted from that because by dint of the fact you have a large force, any distractions or missteps will result in huge losses, even in, if not to some elements of your fleet, but to others, then you want Spruance because Spruance has the technical and mental ability to understand exactly what he needs to do and you can apparently put him in charge of pretty much anything you like and it's not going to go to his head if on the other hand you're in a position of your backs up against the wall you've got limited resources at your disposal and you need to hit the enemy hard and keep hitting them hard in order to get them to go down and stay down even though you're the smaller person smaller um uh, service in at the time that's where you want Cunningham um, or let's put it another way if someone if someone challenges you to a duel or some kind of other formalized fight engagement I would take Spruance whereas if you're drinking at a bar and somebody randomly tries to slam a bench over the back of your head and it's going to dissolve into a close quarters no holds barred no holds barred um, bar brawl I take Cunningham. Christopher Whitmer asks, what would be the best crew member to follow for a writer, either for a main character or for important side characters? I would say it depends greatly on what kind of story you're trying to tell. Um, if you're trying to tell a story that involves the wider world, what the ship's doing, why it's doing it, and I'm assuming, given the channel's date, you're talking about a warship, then you probably want to focus on, as a main character, captain, first officer, or admiral, depending on the size of the ship, because they're the ones who are going to have to be making the decisions and issuing and reading the communiques from the outside world, getting an idea of what's going on overall. So between that and obviously their roles in ordering the ship around and leading that, they're going to have the best point of view to establish what's going on in the larger field of things. If you're looking for side characters who could maybe explore significant sections of the ship and 
what's going on, what people are feeling, what they're, uh, what they're doing, what problems may or may not be arising, then you probably want somebody like uh, the communications officer or if you've got an admiral staff on board, uh, the admiral's flag officer or something like that. So basically someone who's involved with carrying messages to and to and from various parts of the ship, department heads and such like, who's not restricted to particularly to any one given area. That's a good uh, type of uh, person to follow or, or else an experienced, relatively senior engineer. Because whilst obviously engineers tend to be found most commonly, shockingly enough, in the engine rooms, the more senior engineers will be called upon to fix all sorts of things across the ship. So they've got a plausible reason to be wandering around, hitting things with spanners and wrenches and listening to various crewmen gripe about what may or may not be happening, why this thing or that thing is broken, uh, and so on and so forth. So... That, that those are good good people to follow whereas if you look at people like say gun crew well especially if they're in a battleship's turret this is pretty much all they're going to see <laughs> there's only so many ways you can narrate the loading and firing of a gun before it all starts to feel a bit of the same and similarly with magazine and shell room crews as well you're you're down in the magazines and you're passing a charge you're passing a shell occasionally there's a rumble from above yeah um lookouts might be a good one as well people on lookout or radar duty depending on the era obviously if you're talking early you want lookouts if you're going world war ii later on someone in radar central control something like that might be good to follow or if you're looking for a very action-based story and you're looking particularly at something along the lines of uh, World War One, World War Two story, maybe somebody in the fire con uh, fire control system, someone in the fire control system, something's gone horribly, horribly wrong. Um, <laughs> this is a bit squelchy, but someone in the gun direction and fire direction uh, set up. So someone who's operating the range finders or something like that, because they'll get a nice high view of what's going on and will also be directly involved in the actual action itself. Bob Kutsky asks, what are the effects of non-penetrating hits on personnel and equipment behind armour, both physical and, in the case of personnel, um, psychological, in both World War I and World War II when we talk about battleship engagements? Well, when you talk about non-penetrating hits, I'm going to assume that you're talking about armour-piercing rounds as opposed to the impact of high-explosive rounds, because that's a, a whole different uh, kettle of fish. So, when we're looking at non-penetrating AP rounds hitting a ship it can have a number of effects if you're talking about non-penetrations in terms of not quite near misses but not particularly vital hits to the ship itself i.e. maybe something like hits a funnel hits a radio mast hits whatever it's kind of most of the time it's kind of like oh something happened I wonder what that was um usually a loud tearing or crashing or ripping sound accompanies it but not a lot else if you're talking about shells that actually hit the armor but for whatever reason fail to penetrate directly it can be any number of things um depending on the size and scale of the ship and the guns being directed against it. and i know we're talking about world War one world War two capital ship scale but that there is a quite the sliding scale difference when we're talking about these kinds of things um for example being in a turret that's hit by a fairly heavy caliber shell, not a fun experience. If there's one thing worse than standing inside a massive clock tower bell when it's being struck, it's being inside a turret when it gets hit by a shell that's traveling at several times the speed of sound. Um, you, the, the thing will ring, there will be physical shock waves going through the air they may be spalling from the armor there's going to be smoke there's going to be noise there's going to be pressure waves rebounding um it can break a lot of things um even if it doesn't penetrate and well you could imagine from that cacophony i just described what the uh, immediate effects on the gun crew are going to be like now again this kind of this scale so if you look at something like say the battle of jutland 
um, if you were in a really heavily armoured gun turret, um, or a fairly large gun turret, like say, a, I don't know, something on the Queen Elizabeth's 15-inch guns, and you get hit by an 11-inch German shell, the effect's going to be substantially less than if it's the flip side and you're in one of the German battlecruisers 11-inch turrets and somebody flings a 15-inch <laughs> shell at you that doesn't penetrate. Um, an 11-inch, sort of the, the, the smaller shell hitting the larger turret might disable it briefly um, while everyone gets their wits around themselves and figures out what, if anything, was broken. On the other hand, a non-penetrating heavy caliber shell hitting a smaller turret can kill and injure people inside without penetrating it can knock the gun the guns and the turret around to the point it might it might come off its uh roller bearings it might jump it might get you might get debris wedged it something might distort say equipment breaks and so forth and everything in between um as i say depending on the scale of both projectile and turret when you're talking about other things like armor, um, a shell that skips along the deck armor probably isn't going to do all that much unless you happen to be unlucky enough to be directly in the path of the splinters. Um, and obviously it depends on exactly what it's skipping off in terms of deck. If you're talking about a relatively high mounted armored deck that it's skipping off, the effect's probably not going to be noticed by too many people until they, they come out in into the less protected parts of the superstructure after the combat and notice there's holes everywhere. Um, if the, your deck's mounted lower in, then obviously the shell might make a complete mess of certain parts of the ship, such as uh, medical stations or people's cabins or dining halls or whatever, um, even if it doesn't penetrate the armor deck plating. So that that can be completely different, and of course, if you're caught in the out, in the caught in the that portion of the ship when the shell hits above the armor deck, you're in trouble. Um, beneath the armor deck, you're probably fine, um, unless you're directly underneath. So, when you've got a shell that hits the armor belt, on the other hand, um, this is where things go a little bit squiggly, because. Again, it depends on the scale of your armor and the scale of the shell that's hitting you. It could be anything from, oh, that was loud. There was a lot of rumbling and a few bits and pieces twisted slightly, but I wonder what that was. Oh, well, off we go. All the way up to a non-penetrating hit that might actually, even though it doesn't penetrate, might break off a chunk of armor, it might stove in the side, um, as in physically move the plate on and obviously twist the frame such that water's coming in at which point it's time for some fairly serious damage control and obviously that kind of movement happens fairly violently fairly quickly so there may be bits of shrapnel and everything flying around inside but generally speaking hits to the the main armor of the ship the crew inside and the equipment tends to benefit from the fact that the enclosed space is much larger um, even if the rooms themselves are smaller the actual un un enclosed space by the armor continuous armor is significantly larger and thus the effects internally are somewhat less i say unless the the belt armor gets started in so yeah it can be it can be all sorts of weird and wonderful things uh, best case scenario a crewman and the equipment nearby might just notice a slight rumble and vibration and wonder what all the excitement is about worst case it's almost like being inside a tank hit by a large artillery shell and finally for this week Matt Kidd asks, how quickly did the Japanese and Germans realise that the proximity fuse had been deployed, and did they make any adjustments to it? Broadly speaking, um, they didn't, because the proximity fuse, as opposed to the variable timed fuse, uh, was not deployed until relatively late in the war, and it was pretty well guarded as a secret, to the point that for a long period of time, it was actually forbidden to use them in areas where a dud shell might be picked up by the enemy and examined. So when you look at how they were used to start with in things like uh, five inch ammunition for use against kamikazes, well, by the nature of kamikazes, aren't going to go back to tell anyone about what happened to them. Um, V1 flying bombs, again, V1s aren't manned and they're not going to go back to Germany with recordings of what killed them and so on and so forth, you do see some of them start to be used in artillery shells and such, like in 
more proactive roles against enemies on land and obviously as time goes on they're deployed more and more in various anti-aircraft batteries so you will see um, various pilots having to react to them but the thing is at the end of the day a proximity fuse barrage is somewhat difficult to tell apart from a very well timed variable time fuse barrage because they both result in roughly the same thing which is shells exploding around the aircraft so as far as that's concerned initially at least until people start noticing a pattern it's it's difficult to work out what's even happening or that anything is happening particularly new and to be perfectly honest if you manage to fly through multiple barrages of proximity fused rounds you've you've probably got some form of divine protection at which point um the you're probably going to no, be noticing that more than the fact that the enemy shells seem to be exploding around you a lot more often than not to be perfectly honest by the time the proximity fuse was out there in large enough numbers and in being used in scenarios such that the german and japanese military uh, officers and men would actually notice something was happening um, unusual and that perhaps some new form of fuse has been invented and passed up to their superior it was far too late in the war for them to do anything about it um, about the closest you could get in a terms of direct reaction was japanese pilots had taking a habit of having worked out almost exactly what the lethal radius of the five inch 38 caliber gun was just orbiting outside of that in preparation for their attack runs uh, but I, I can't seem to find any particular indication that this is in direct response to the proximity fuse itself it was more just a response to the general ungodly barrage of anti-aircraft firepower that the uh, u.s navy was putting up which of course did then <laughs> it was very handy for everybody because then when uh longer range heavy aa showed up towards the end of the pacific war particularly things like the now fixed 5.25 inch you had all these Japanese pilots lazily doing loops. It's like, aha, we are several hundred yards outside of your lethal radius. You can't touch us. You can't. Boom. Oh. Well, that was annoying. I guess I'll kamikaze into this fish. And just time for a little bit of channel admin. Uh, the first print run of Thunderchild posters are now sold out. So... The two big batches have been shipped out. I know one or two people have received theirs. Um, hopefully, if you've received a shipping notification by now, hopefully it should have arrived. Um, if it hasn't, uh, please let me know. If it has and you don't mind, please let me know. Maybe I can work out a pattern of where they're arriving and where they're not based on that. Um, so, yeah, I think I think everything's shipped out now. If there's enough interest, I might order another print run, another batch run done for at some point later on in the year. Um, and yeah, we'll see. We'll see how that goes. Other minor bits and pieces. Um, so I'm now doing a podcast for uh, with Dr. Alexander Clark and Armored Carriers. Uh, we have decided we are calling it The Bilge Pumps, and that podcast should be available soon on the Simsec website, I believe. So yes, if you've wanted if you've wanted to hear me talk about ships and tactics and stuff that post-date 1950, um, that's probably the only place you're going to hear me talking about them in any form of recorded format, because it's, uh, it's a subjective uh, thing. It's a uh, it's a podcast where we're all knocking ideas around and discussing v events both historical and current so yeah check that out um at some point uh, i'll see if i if i know where the it's going to be hosted by the time this goes live i will try and put a link uh in the description if not well the simsec website should be fairly easy to find and so with that, I think it's time to wrap up this video. Thank you very much for watching, indeed, as always. And I hope to see you again in another video. And I think it's time for me to don my PPE, head out to the supermarket, brave the hordes, and try and pick up some good old field rations. Ah, it's a good time to be shiny. See you later.